you know, when, when I when I was uh, running Smith and Nephew's Orthopedics, we had hip knees and trauma products, and we'd give the patient a card, and they'd know what hip or knee went in them. If I was in that job today, um, I'd be uh, engaging that consumer before the operation. Uh, I'd find ways for them to understand who we are mm-hmm. and and what we do and uh, what choices they have and 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 what they should experience. Uh, and then I would also um, find ways after the procedure to continue that relationship. Because I think the consumer empowerment and the consumer awareness uh, in healthcare is only going to grow. And I think it'll grow in Moore's Law. It'll double every year going forward. Um, and so uh, in understanding and building into our strategy what that consumer engagement would look like uh, and how uh, you never know how uh, you could benefit the patient by having this ongoing dialogue. And, and, and it's also quality control. If something goes wrong, whatnot, then you have that data to, to learn going forward. So I, I think whether, whether it's in the go-to-market strategy or uh, whether it's in the development of the business, uh, it, we have to think uh, much more about that consumer uh, engagement because um, you know companies like Teladoc and American Well and others are creating relationships directly with patients now mm-hmm. based upon a, a provider funding, and that affects now uh, or a payer funding, and that affects which provider they go to or whether they go to a provider, and that can be inc- it's just an incredibly disruptive model. And I think companies who can empower can still provide classic benefits within you know, within healthcare but also provide additional data empowerment education to a consumer, uh, it may affect uh, certain businesses like orthopedics from becoming commoditized. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, I would, if I were running a company, a classic medical device company today, I would be doing everything to not just focus on the point solution where Mm -hmm. my device is used, but to understand the patients before and after uh, try to control more of the data and the experience and to create a relationship that, you know, as that patient, you know, is having a great experience with their knees and now has a hip, maybe they become brand loyal. Maybe they tell the doctor they want a Smith and nephew hip. And I know that's, you know, that's sacrilegious because doctors do know best, but I also know in orthopedics, you know, doctors have a choice and um, Mm -hmm. uh, it's not always, you know, there, there's a lot of factors in the in the buy decision. So, um, I think you know companies should think more of today in the digital era about that consumer engagement, regardless of the product. Welcome to Message Engineer. I am Maureen Schaefer, and. And every week, we're turning to some of the leading lights in the medical device and health IT business world to learn how to improve our messages to drive funding and revenue. Uh, Today, we're here with Joe DeVivo. And uh, Joe is a 30-year medical device and health IT veteran. Uh, He has been CEO or president at his last five startup companies and has accumulated multiple highly successful M&A events. Uh, Joe is joining us today from his home in Memphis, Tennessee. Joe, it is wonderful to have you here today. It's such a pleasure, Maureen. So great to be with you again. Uh, So Joe, what we do is we start out with what I call define the word warm up, and uh, we'll set the boundary of thinking about these as kind of startups in med device and healthcare, health IT, digital health space. So just share kind of what comes to mind and how you think about uh, these different concepts. So we'll start, we'll start okay. with an easy one, <laughs> healthcare. Oh boy, um, how is that easy? Uh, something so broad. Um, well, I, I'm hoping that healthcare um, turns into the consumer, the patient, the person's 
journey that they take proactively. Um, you know, healthcare today uh, is so much of sick care and so much of addressing an issue, um, you know, when it occurs, not when the behavior that potentially generated it, of course, you know, save chronic disease management, but um, healthcare has to be about wellness. It has to be about uh, improving um, behavior and decisions and um, and living a, a healthier life. Uh, that's my my hope for healthcare. Um, but you know, if prior to this digital health experience I've gone through, you know, healthcare really, uh, if you asked me maybe three or four years ago, uh, healthcare would be sick care. Um, it would be something that you enter the system when you absolutely needed it, you know, or, or you had to. Um, I think, you know, as, as our, our generation in this world is evolving and we're becoming more digital and we're getting more data. Uh, um, my hope is healthcare is is proactive and more cost effective and has great access and and is something that uh, starts a lot earlier um, uh, in in the mm. spectrum. So that that's my response. Uh, great, great uh, point you make there about healthcare really in having been and still predominantly about sick care, not health care, right? Not about wellness. Not about being proactive, uh, not about trying to intervene early to prevent right some of these things to really be health care or uh, moving in that direction. So well, there was a, a cardiac surgeon that we actually worked with um, way back in the day. Um, pretty famous one now from Columbia Presbyterian, but I won't mention his <laughs> name. But he was always the uh, he was always um, so frustrated when people came and wanted their ailment fixed, um, but they weren't going to quit smoking. They weren't going to start exercising. They weren't going to do. And so he would literally tell them uh, that he wouldn't operate on them until they quit smoking or that he wouldn't operate on them until they changed the type mm -hmm. of behavior. Uh, Cause he's like, if they're not going to be a part of their own, their own care, why should I, you know, do this? And so, he got very involved in, in helping people change their lives and not just, um, you know, doing a procedure and calling it a day. That's a, yeah, that's a great example. That's a great example. Yes. We, we know him. <laughs> we know him. The whole world. Especially Anne Marie knew him. Ah, uh, there you go. The whole world know him. Yeah. From when we were U.S. surgical. Yeah. So. I was trying to run for Senate. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Forgot about that. All right, so this dovetails nicely into the next one, uh, which is health IT. There are all these intersecting, right? Digital health, med devices, health IT. And if, how yes. do you think about health IT? What is that? Um, well, you know, I've actually given a talk on uh, what I'm going to tell you as far as my impression of health IT is, you know, being in medical device for so long. You know, you, you, you create a, a tremendous respect for the regulatory environment. You know, a lot of people look at these as barriers, but the truth is they're put in place to make patients safe. You know, your manufacturing processes, your quality process, the labeling and what you say uh, to a patient and, and what you're able to promote and market. There is this impression that software, uh, it has some other bar uh, to jump over, or maybe doesn't have a bar at all. Um, but I always ask myself in healthcare IT, um, where does IT end and healthcare mm -hmm. begin? Um, and the moment software is getting more and more into clinical decision making, more and more into informing uh, important decisions for the consumer or for, for the physician, then that software also has consequence. And that software should have a level of regulatory oversight to ensure that if we're informing someone, we're doing it correctly. Um, instead of just some, you know, some respirator monitor or, or blood glucose monitor you put on your finger, that's, you know, plus or minus 15% accurate. You know, that, that wouldn't meet a medical mm -hmm. standard. 
um, or other types of ways that we give guidance. So when I think of healthcare IT, I think of the necessity to power our industry, but also to understand there's healthcare in there. And just because you're a software company and you have an application and now you want to get into the healthcare market, you have to play by the healthcare rules and you have to ensure that the patient safety, uh, that the data integrity uh, and also the medical necessity of what you're doing is appropriate. And, and so I always uh, come at healthcare IT um, from making sure that, you know, where is that line between just uh, curating information and, and, and integrating systems and providing uh, very important functionality um, you know, to where it becomes healthcare and where it actually now um, we should be concerned about labeling what we say, uh, and also, you know, we should ensure that uh, it works at the same level. Just because something's a piece of plastic and it goes inside the body doesn't mean it could hurt anyone any more than, you know, misinformation or um, or bad ways of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of implementing uh, certain steps. So uh, I think that the moral obligation of healthcare IT is just as high. Uh, as it is for other parts of the industry. Yeah, great, great points that health IT does everything from kind of curating and organizing, right, and pulling in information in dashboard into one place to moving in the direction or all the way to kind of clinical decision making. Um, and, right, mm -hmm. the, the FDA has, in the United States, has some very clear guidelines for when they think that happens. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I became passionate about that, especially having a telemedicine company where we where we help uh, doctors diagnose a stroke. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, when when a neurologist does a stroke consult, they're making a life or de death decision because if the patient's healthy and they're getting this bolus, um, it could harm them or even kill them. And if they are having a stroke and uh, they're misdiagnosed and are, and don't get uh, the TPA, um, they can also see the full effects of that stroke. And so when you when you outsource and you say, okay, I'm going to use a remote physician, well, you know, the technology's got to work, yes. you know, and because the consequence of the patient, if it doesn't, is is quite high. And so, you know, you, you still have to meet those regulatory bars and you have to, you know, regardless of what regulation the FDA puts on something, whatever, you know, especially if any company has a new application and the FDA hasn't caught up to the art of AI or some mm -hmm. nuance, you know, it, it's it's on your ethical karma. It's on your back to make sure that what you put out there, even before uh, FDA figures out how to regulate it or FCC or other regulatory bodies, you know, I, I think everyone has to have the moral compass to do the right thing. I think, yeah, a couple very important comments, very important uh, concepts to understand how that applies, where and how, and what the potential outcome is if, you know, if done incorrectly. And I think uh, two of the words that hit me that you said were moral and ethical, you know, moral and ethical kind of compass going to mash up two different things you said, um, because we can't, it's not always in the legislate, right? It's not always in the law. It's not always written down. Um, but we need to know at the end of the day, hey, is, you know, which way is the right way? And, uh, right. And also, you know, I mean, how cool is it to do what we do? Uh, right. I mean, no, no, no one, you know, probably no one out there realizes, but, you know, you and I worked together a long time ago. I won't, uh, I won't put dates out there, um, but it was a very long time ago. And I'm so proud of, of, of your career progression and what you've done. And, and our colleagues, if you just imagine back in that day, you know, who they were and then what they've become. And to do it in an environment where, you know, you're building your career, you're making money for your family, you're doing all these great things. But every once in a while, you're like, wow, we just helped mm -hmm. someone today. Wow, we made a difference in someone's life. That operation was easier for them, or they we taught them this, or you know, this technique or this way of doing something improved their life. And even when you go back to define healthcare, you know, there there's such you know, for everyone who's listening uh, to this to this podcast and is in the medical device field, you know, I mean, wow, it's it's just, and if you're new to this field, 
it's it's going to reward you in ways that you won't you won't know consciously. You'll just learn that something that was done impacted someone, and it'll affect you in a way. And so that that's the other beautiful part of healthcare is is where so it's an interesting, complex environment, but there's so many great people wanting to help people, and that's that's uh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's. I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said there. I mean, it is. It's so busy sometimes in the kind of day to day that stepping back from it can be uh, quite, I don't know, awe inspiring sometimes to see what a group of people working towards a common vision can accomplish, right? And what good can be done. Yeah, very much so. So, very much so. Awesome. Thanks for not sharing the dates. We both have a vested there interest you go. in that. You've been around for a minute. We know a few things. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. So patient safety, medical necessity you dropped in there, super critical concept. Uh, don't want that to pass people by. Uh, and more, moral and ethical compass kind of as it relates to IT. So even if it's software, you're doing things to take care of people and help people in the healthcare space. Those are great, Joe's sharing, you're sharing some great concepts for people to orient themselves to and make sure they accomplish and consider. So uh, two last, two last words. So uh, messaging, what do you think when you think about messaging? Um, It's, it's crucial. Um, The, it has such power when uh, there's clarity and simplicity and especially if the listener to the message has a prior context that you can pull from, Um, you know, having a a, messaging um, is extremely important for corporate culture, for morale, for um, the ability of customers to understand um, what you're about and for all the constituents to understand, um, it's more powerful today because messaging has so many different outlets and so many different venues, especially in this digital and social, uh, media age. And, you know, the ability to get messaging out actually, you know, has become easier uh, than ever. And so, um, if you have unclear messaging, you really hold yourself back. And if you hit the mark and your messaging resonates, especially in an environment where you don't have the type of advertising dollars to just change people's minds or educate them on something new, a clear message that resonates, um, you know, can be worth gold to any new company. Um, And people should spend the type of time and energy on messaging as they do on developing their product and and, uh, you know, developing their value prop. So great, great, great answer. I, of course, wholeheartedly agree with you <laughs> on that, that it is, you need to know, right, what you're talking about is you're saying that you need to know and develop your message kind of a lot, you know, with the same importance as product development, right? Because we've all seen those technologies, right, that are developed, that are super cool, but they haven't really thought through the message to whom they're selling, what they want, what they need, how they buy, things like that. So uh, some really critical concepts you share in there. Uh, so uh, kind of jumping out of defining words, <laughs> uh, kind of into the main thing. Okay. I think one of the things that uh, is really interesting is that you've had this tremendous opportunity to lead five startup companies. And uh, and most recently uh, in Touch Health, which was purchased by Teladoc. And so when you think about messaging, because there are, as you said, many people, many constituents, uh, as we think about it as relates to investors and because funding drives the ability largely to kind of move forward, how do you th- Think about messaging investors. Is it different in kind of med device versus health IT? And uh, 
Are there things that, are there examples you can share where, you know, maybe it didn't go as well as you had hoped, or maybe it went, it went very well. So again, messaging kind of to investors and how do you think about that? Well, um, so I do think that um, the different sectors have a different uh, set of communication to investors. So, you know, there are different, you, you really need to understand who you're pitching. Are you pitching a venture or you're pitching someone who is uh, susceptible to an, an A round or an angel? You're looking for someone who needs to have revenue. Uh, or is a growth investor or one that needs to needs to see EBITDA, needs to see that type of progress. So uh, obviously the first thing is knowing the the investment thesis of the investor that you're communicating to. So, uh, you know, because you might even be completely wasting your time uh, if the stage of your company is not at, you know, the stage that the investor wishes to be at. Um, and, but that's a basic, you should know that. Um, the the other part is to is if you're a medical device company, you're going to get valued based upon you know, uh, you know people are going to want to see very high gross margins. They're going to want to see you know a leverage in the in the P and L over a period of time. Uh, if you're a if you're a SaaS company, um, they're going to be more interested in the trajectory of your subscribers and and what you know and the stickiness and to understand, you know, how much renewal you have, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's going to be a, a whole set of metrics uh, and a whole language based upon the business mm -hmm. that you're in that's necessary to, um, you know, communicate so they can compare you to other investments and they can see how you're doing. You, you know, there's everyone thinks they're unique. Um, I would try to assimilate towards a certain successful investment thesis and a certain model that people and use the metrics that they feel comfortable with that they've seen with other companies. Um, you know, what's your CAC, what's your, you know, what's your, your you know, lifetime, uh, you know, uh, survival from a customer standpoint. So, so knowing the metrics of your market and being able to compare your metrics to other companies is going to make it easier mm -hmm. for investors. Um, I think the mistakes that I've made in the past in raising money is I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big vision guy. And so I, I get really passionate about, hey, what can happen? Um, uh, but it's so important also to ensure that there's a direct line between this great vision you have, but also how that translates financially and how and, and financially from the hardest thing in any model, in any investment is, you know, you can you can predict and, and get a sense that you're serving a need you can get a sense of how big the opportunity is but the one thing you can't control is time um, you know with telemedicine the, the companies like in touch health uh, and teledoc for that matter had been at it for 20 years before covid but all of a sudden now it's obvious and this you know this crisis creates this opportunity for significant awareness and, and evolution compression. Um, but you can't predict time. And you know, things might take longer, they might, might might be sooner. And so not only, you know, every investor sees these forecasts, you know, that if you especially if you're a revenue company, they probably see this, you know, poor past performance. And then the moment you're raising money, everything's gonna hockey stick up and to the right. Um, so you know, they, they all kind of roll their eyes at that. But being able to translate your vision into a specific financial success that can compare to other companies and you can and you have a certain level of control or if you can really show why you, the timeline that you're presenting them works. You know, most most of these companies that are out there, they're, they're very successful ideas. It's just, are you going to raise enough money? Do you have the team to execute it and it, within the time frame of that money? And is the market going to receive it uh, in the way that meets your timeline? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the hardest thing uh, in, in, in the investment side. And not thinking that through and not understanding all those levers, that, the ones that you control, but also the ones that you don't control. Um, that, mm -hmm. you know, the more you tackle that, the more impressed uh, the investors will be, uh, the more they'll uh, look at you as a, as a bankable CEO. Um, you know, a visionary whose feet aren't touching the ground, 
who doesn't understand how it takes to to get from A to B, but they see something. You know, that's a very dangerous formula. And I've been in it and I've seen it. And I've seen companies who haven't reached their potential and the and the and the founders still evangelize. Um, and you get to a point where you, where you lose faith. So that the timing of everything, it's not just the 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 value prop that you create. Uh, of course, you know, everything they're doing with payment and how how the, the financials come in, comparing yourselves with metrics that the investors are familiar with, and then really convincing them that, you know, that the money that you're bringing in is going to get you to a certain place uh, and that they buy into that. So um, I hope that's helpful. Rambling. Yeah, that. no, that's those are I think that's tremendous. I love the idea of comparing. Right. We all talk about I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of things. Uh, everyone talks about comparables, right? And having comparables, but the, you brought forth this idea of comparing yourself, uh, in your metrics to those of other companies and where you see yourself. And I think that's something I haven't, I haven't often seen. I usually see one slide on comparables go flying by. <laughs> uh, it's like this company exited at a high multiple, this company exited at a high multiple, but they don't kind of dive more deeply into, hey, this is what other people are doing in the space. This is what we think we're going to do in the space, kind of from a metrics standpoint to make it more real. So I love, I love that idea. I think that's a great idea. Um, and I think you you talked about, you know, we all we all know reuse of proceeds, right? What are you going to use this for? People have a laundry list, sometimes bullets. But how is that really going to be put to work and really drive to a specific finish line in a very real and meaningful way? Um, yeah, investors don't like the concept of um, you know just paying back mm -hmm. debt, or there's a, another shareholder who wants to get their shares out. Uh, you know, investors want to believe the money they put in the business is going to be a catalyst for the next value creating mm -hmm. event. And so if, if your rationale for raising money uh, doesn't have that catalyzing event where the, where the investor feels that their money is going to create value, then your investment thesis is not going to be as mm -hmm. value to them. And I've seen that in certain occasions, more when you're a public company or more when you're a little bit farther mm -hmm. along, uh, of course, um, because you know a lot of startups obviously are, are funding their operations and, and their development. But, um, but being able to 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 show investors um, the value that will be created from this round of investment uh, is very important because that gives them comfort. Um, and then knowing, you know, how far this investment is going to take them and what's next uh, is also very important because people don't want to just put money into the abyss. So, <clears throat> yeah, the endless abyss. That's not a good place for millions of dollars to go. So value creation, no, no. Uh, I love that idea of it being a catalyst. Like what does this specifically catalyze uh, to drive the value mm -hmm. forward? And that idea of the market receipt, you've talked about this idea of the market receiving it uh, a couple of times. And so many people, I, right, everyone's like, it is, and the revenue can be only a 1%, $2 billion, right? And everyone's like, no. Like specifics, why? And I love that idea of how will the market receive it or why will the market receive it? What's going on? What's happening? Um, where are people? What else is out there? Why is this going to be something that will move the needle? And you'll really be able to get traction with the market right. on as opposed to our and that's why it's so important. Yeah, that's why it's so important to do market testing and you know, because, you know, to put your thesis to work and to show that, you know, what you believe is going to happen, whether it's a clinical study or whether it's a, a pilot or whether, you know, anything that has those proof sources that show uh, that, you know, traction is going to happen in reality is, is, is so important. And investors do look at that too. Yeah, absolutely. So understanding the stage, putting together the, uh, the, putting together a plan that is meaningful uh, and realistic and very well thought out and being able to kind of speak to how that money specifically for that round uh, leads to specific value creation and what that looks like. 
with yep. industry standard metrics, whether it's med device or SaaS software, right? Where metrics are very different that they're looking for. Yep, yeah, very much so. So uh, to kind of pull from a point you uh, were just talking about is this idea of what do they need to see that are pro- that proves that this is real or could be real? Um, and you're talking about uh, studies. And I know that I think the last time I saw you was like 10 years ago at an Avamed meeting and you were on a panel. You were talking about, they were asking about what do you need to go to market? What's necessary for launch? Uh, and you talked about at that point, a relatively new idea of having kind of an economic argument and an economic analysis for why it behooves them to adopt a specific technology. And that is the facility, you know, the ho- whoever the buyers are, the hospital, the ASC, the, the IDN, kind of whichever level that might be. Um, and, uh, and you just talked about studies. And so when you think about going to, going to market, right, or pre-market with a, with a message, and you're talking to this kind of broader spectrum of, uh, for now, like, let's say like patients, hmm, providers, you know, facilities and buyers, kind of four of the pieces. What do you think, we know economic analyses are important. Uh, what do you think are the critical pieces that are needed when you go to market with, with software or medical device these days? Well, well, first of all, thank you for remembering. I don't, I don't even remember I was on that panel. That's how bad my memory is. So the fact that you remember what was said 10 years ago, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, especially in, in early startups, um, you know, that the, it's kind of what I mentioned before is that it's so important to have uh, the, e- the economics understood and how you're going to extract value and to test that uh, as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, there, it, there are so many, if we build it, they will come out there. There are so many incredibly visionary founders who see what's going to mm-hmm. happen. Um, but again, uh, you know, turning this marvelous idea uh, into a financial entity requires, you know, there's a lot of variables that you don't control. And, and, and it's amazing how many people don't think through that early enough. They believe if they solve this problem, um, you know, people will see the value. And then when they get down to pricing, I mean, pricing is as much of a brand uh, as brand is because it's what you're communicating your value prop uh, is. And, you know, to the extent of, you know, uh, companies like Twitter where you get on and you can do it for free and then it's advertising or TikTok or others. You know, the business model makes the business. Yeah, it's great that you can do this, but the fact it's free and then, hey, you can even get paid. Uh, you know, those are things that, that drive uh, your success. And so, you know, making sure early on, uh, you know, what is your economic threshold? How, how can you use, you know, and, and sometimes when you think of each of those four channels, um, you know, you might leverage strength in one channel to build uh, capability and to build penetration in others. For example, if you can get payers to pay for something and it's free to consumers, then that's awesome. And then you, so now you can go market to consumers that they can get something for free, um, but payers are paying for it. Um, so, so understanding how you can create a value proposition, but then that value proposition can then leverage into different markets, uh, I, I think is incredibly important. And also, I would pay uh, for s- studies or I would pay for upfront work uh, to test your thesis. Because again, mm. uh, a strong thesis with some evidence is very bankable. Um, but again, there's so many, so many visionary and evangelical founders that you know, um, don't feel like that work is necessary yet. Or don't understand, you know, the, the bad part of healthcare is, you know, if it doesn't make financial sense, it ain't happening, even if it's going to save your life. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that was a hard thing for me to to learn because, uh, you know, there was, you know, I was working for a company called Rita Medical that made uh, ablation devices that would destroy 
uh, inoperable tumors uh, in solid organs. It's really cool technology and the way that it would create the burn and how well you can manage it and how close you can get to vital structures and the technology was incredible. But, you know, a, a medical oncologist one day said to me, you know, well, why would I destroy the, term, the, the tumor? Um, you know, how do I know if my chemotherapy is going to work? You know, because for them, success is taking a tumor and, you know, going from 100% down to 80%. Um, and so different people come from these different vantage points. But because the medical oncologist controlled the market, not the radiologist who did the ablation, it was so hard at that time to get past that particular barrier. And here we are, you can stick a needle and destroy a tumor, reduce the tumor load and obviate the need in certain cases, uh, you know, for chemotherapy at all or, or that type of systemic chemotherapy. So, um, you know, where you are on the food chain, uh, it's not just about, hey, we can kill all of these inoperable tumors. It's about, well, who's going to do the procedure? Who controls that patient? Is it in that person's economic, uh, in, you know, benefit to do what you're doing? Or are you taking cases away from them? And that, that part, when I really understood that, that was the first time that in healthcare, it was like a gut punch where you're like, wow, you mean you won't just do something because it's right? You won't do something because it's going to help somebody? Uh, you're going to be more interested in what it means for, you know, we, in, for your subspecialty. Um, and, and that part of it, you know, especially for newcomers in the healthcare, uh, if you're a software and you're coming in, you know, if, if your payment isn't in line, um, people aren't just going to do things because it's right. And, uh, it, you know, that's the ugly part of medicine that, um, you know, that, that you do learn at some point. I think, yeah, a great point about there needing to be kind of clinical efficacy, right? Studies and things like that, value, right? Uh, alongside economics, like they need to match up. And uh, a big part of that, what you're talking about is this idea of, people call it different things, right? The patient journey or referral path, like who's treating, right? Who's treating the patient? You said who controls the patient? Um, who's treating the patient? makes an enormous difference. And I think. Yeah. You know, in the last, oh, ooh, okay. I'm sorry. No, please. <laughs> uh, I, to your, to your point about that being a gut punch. You now I've had uh, my business working with startups for 10 years now. And one of the most common things I see is that was that they've devised, right. They're visionaries. They've done a lot of work. They developed something they think is really going to solve a big problem, but they haven't. But when I help them map out like, okay, patient sitting at home, what happens? Then who do they see? What happens? Like which tests are run? Then who do they see? What tests or procedures are done, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, do you realize you're all the way out, like past the end? you know, or with the, like the very last person to potentially see them and that the person that the medical specialty ahead of them is, <laughs> has the ability to do the procedure, like more recently, has the ability to do both another procedure and the one you're talking about at the same time. Like you don't need to be working with this metal medical specialty at the bit, at the bitter end. You need to be working at the one who sees most of the patients. Uh, so, and then the economics, right? When I walk people through, well, this is kind of how the reimbursement, let's map the journey. Let's look at the reimbursement kind of along the way. What are, what's in it for people to, you know, doing good, clinical efficacy and the economics. And I'm like, there's, doesn't work here. What you're talking about, the monies you're talking about, the numbers don't work. And they're like, no, 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 but it's going to do good. Right. <laughs> No, and that and that and being in touch with that reality is so important. I remember, you know, when we were uh, we were working together, we, there was this whole effort on minimally invasive uh, cardiac surgery and and how you can make a smaller incision and let a, a cardiac surgeon 
do a lima to the LAD, which is, you know, take down the artery on the chest and sew it to the top part of, of the heart without having to stop mm -hmm. it. And, you know, the left anterior descending is, you know, 70% of blood flow to the heart. And it's such a successful operation that was pioneered out of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, but now, uh, you know, the, the, the moment the stents were approved, Johnson Johnson's first bare metal stent became a billion dollar business within 12 months. Um, and the efficacy of stents at that time were nowhere near the same as, as cardiac surgery. And, and certainly, if the cardiologists weren't the ones controlling the patients, you might see a different split if the economic uh, models were different, the referral models were different. But I remember, I don't know if you remember uh, Peter Bercher, oh, um, but yes. Peter uh, ran international for U.S. Surgical. Remember that? He's an Australian gentleman, wonderful, beautiful man, uh, had helped the U.S. Surgical Auto Suture build the business over in Europe. And uh, right during this time of minimally invasive beating heart surgery and then stents coming out, uh, he had a, a bare metal stent placed in his upper LAD. Uh, it occluded and he died. And I was so angry and bitter uh, from that because knowing, you know, if he just had a Lima to the LAD, if he just had, a, a, you know, yes. yeah, it's more invasive to have that surgery, but it's 99% effective that that vessel stays open. But of course, you know, he, the, he had to be pushed to the newest thing and to, you know, a specialty that controls the patient. Um, it's, for me, it's, it's, I, I think there's a lot of that in healthcare and I think especially, uh, you know, healthcare CEOs and those visionaries that you're dealing with have to really be sanguine, uh, around what are the existing, uh, financial motivators, uh, who are the influencers. Mm -hmm. And if they are not in your favor, you have to have it a part of your business plan, how you're going to confront that and deal with that. Because just believing that someone's going to do the right thing um, is unfortunately not always the case. Yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you on that 100 uh, percent. And I think that uh, what was interesting and I think what is valuable about us, you know, talking today and sharing our perspectives is that it's interesting you bring up cardiac surgery because that very same company that I was thinking of, and there are others, uh, where I said, look, you're, you're like way out at the end of the, <laughs> the line here. You need to move up a specialty, like move it back one. And I shared what happened with cardiac surgery and interventional cardiology and how it wasn't, interve it didn't exist, interventional cardiology. It was diagnostic cardiology, right? They were like blow and die and doing diagnostics. And then they sent them to the cardiac surgeon. And along came the ability, right, to, hey, you're blowing the dye in, you already have femoral ac at that time, right? Femoral access. How about a balloon? How about a sten? How about you can treat it at the same time? And for patients, that's a win win, right? Who wants to go back to the hospital multiple times? Nobody, at least nobody I know. <laughs> And, but they were, a, right, ahead in the referral, right? They're doing all the diagnostics. They're ahead of the cardiac surgeon in the referral chain. Shifted everything up. So, yeah, they. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. This group, they're uh, kind of a group of kind of first time medical device CEO, right? Younger, super brilliant. Uh, but they hadn't heard that story. So that was really that was super compelling to them to hear that. And you and I, we just think about this as of course we know this. <laughs> so we have scars, we have battle scars. A couple. <laughs> a couple. So uh, but it's great because those are great opportunities to learn, right? Uh, and I think that's a great example that you bring up about cardiac surgery and minimally invasive and you know, the new things from Peter Bircher. And I didn't know that exact story about him. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so he's a great man. Yeah. I do remember him. <laughs> uh, so we talked a little bit about investors. We talked a little bit about kind of health IT. 
Uh, one of the things that I think is, is really unique, I think there are kind of two more things uh, that I want to talk about. You talk a little bit about how it shifted and we've always in the past, in the past, it was always about the provider, right? That generally speaking, the, the physician or in a lot of the things that you and I have been involved in surgeons, um, from that standpoint where the, the physician surgeons were making the bulk of the decisions and the patients were involved, but in a very peripheral kind of way. Um, can you talk about if you think with health IT and digital health and, you know, with in touch health, specifically in Teladoc, is that changing? Should we be thinking about that differently uh, across kind of med devices and health IT? What are your kind of thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, the, I, I think companies, what, what's happening today is that we've had, you know, the, the traditional, um, the, the traditional pillars of you have the payer and then you have the provider and then you have the employer and then you have the patient. And uh, each one of those had their own ecosystems and would mm -hmm. stay in their swim lanes and you're in, you're selling to a provider or you're selling into a payer and they're very, very different uh, uh, thought processes, economic models, there's sales process, sales cycle. Um, and then, you know, going direct to consumer or, um, you know, going and building an employer channel. Um, those lines, digital is, is affording those lines to blur. And the most disruptive companies are the ones that are looking at value props that um, don't stay within that, you know, each one of those classic definitions, but is solving a problem that can potentially span all of them. And I think, you know, when, when I went through training and, and when I uh, came into this, this field, um, gosh, again, 30 years ago, um, you know, I, I was trained to not engage with the patient. You know, we are device salespeople and we are in the hospital and it's a, we we're there to, you know, promote and educate, you know, new opportunities. Um, but you never would talk to the patient. Um, I think today that's different. And I think digital allows you to bridge a lot of the classic constituencies. And I think, I think, you know, there's so much data out there now of hospitals and their EMRs know as, uh, potentially more about your product than you may know, just because they have all this real time. You know, we, we talk about, you know, getting FDA approval, you do this very sterile clinical trial. And then when the product's out in the marketplace, there's this whole other set of user data. And I think companies should be thinking more about you know, when, when I when I was uh, running Smith and Nephews Orthopedics, we had hip knees and trauma products, and we'd give the patient a card, and they'd know what hip or knee went in them. If I was in that job today, um, I'd be uh, engaging that consumer before the operation. Uh, I'd find ways for them to understand who we are mm -hmm. and and what we do and uh, what choices they have and 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 what they should experience. Uh, and then I would also um, find ways after the procedure to continue that relationship because I think the consumer empowerment and the consumer awareness uh, in healthcare is only going to grow. And I think it'll grow in Moore's law. It'll double every year going forward. Um, and so uh, understanding and building into our strategy, what that consumer engagement would look like uh, and how uh, you never know how, uh, you could benefit the patient by having this ongoing dialogue. And, and, and it's also quality control. If something goes wrong, whatnot, then you have that data to, to learn going forward. So I, I think whether, whether it's in the go-to-market strategy or uh, whether it's in the development of the business, uh, it, we have to think uh, much more about that consumer uh, engagement because um, you know companies like Teladoc and American Well and others are creating relationships directly with patients now mm -hmm. based upon the, a provider funding, and that affects now 
uh, or a payer funding, and that affects which provider they go to or whether they go to a provider. And that can be, it's just an incredibly disruptive model. And I think companies who can empower can still provide classic benefits within, you know, within healthcare, but also provide additional data empowerment and education to a consumer. Uh, it may affect uh, certain businesses like orthopedics from becoming commoditized. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, I would, if I were running a company, a classic medical device company today, I would be doing everything to not just focus on the point solution where mm-hmm. my device is used, but to understand the patients before and after, uh, try to control more of the data and the experience. And to create a relationship that, you know, as that patient, you know, is having a great experience with their knees and now has a hip, maybe they become brand loyal. Maybe they tell the doctor they want to smith a nephew hip. And I know that's, you know, that's sacrilegious because doctors do know best. But I also know in orthopedics, you know, doctors have a choice and um, mm-hmm. uh, it's not always, you know, there, there's a lot of factors in the, in the buy decision. So um, I think you know, companies should think more of today in the digital era about that consumer engagement, regardless of the product, because it'll give you more control over pricing. Uh, it'll give you more control over distribution. Mm-hmm. It won't. It, it potentially will help you negotiate with a with a provider uh, if you have, you know, uh, consumer credentials that mm-hmm. they just can't whipsaw you into some type of contract. Mm-hmm. And so, thinking outside the box. Uh, I, I think um, you know would, is what the next set of valuable companies will do. Uh, I great kind of great advice that you're sharing about engaging uh, what we've typically called patients in the past, right? But healthcare consumers, all of us included, <laughs> and uh, how around whether it's medical devices or health, healthcare, health IT, whatever you may be doing. Uh, Interesting about the idea of staying away from commoditization um, by developing that relationship. Uh, Obviously, as you pointed out, a great source of information and kind of data about what they want, what works, what doesn't work, and why, uh, where we could kind of close circle things potentially and improve things on the kind of, you know, industry side uh, to help benefit patients, which then helps, you know, uh, with the data and the information that can be shared with providers, payers, and others who are wondering about who they should be contracting with and why. So kind of making that richer. Well, again, if you think about it, if, 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 you, define, if you define the consumer as a patient, mm-hmm then you're defining them as uh, basically a someone who is going to engage with you for the moment of that operation. Mm-hmm. If you think of them as a health consumer um, who has power over their decision making, then you wish to engage and message them and engage with them earlier. Um, and you wish to help them on their journey mm-hmm. after. And so it broadens your thinking horizontally and it creates new market opportunities for new products, new ways of interfacing with your product, uh, and also greater stickiness. But if you just think about them as a patient, um, then they're just this disempowered person mm-hmm. who is, you know, whose clinical decision making is just made by their physician. Uh, and I think, you know, people move, people are dynamic and uh, and they're getting more and more empowered and more uh, educated. So I, I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah, I think there's a yeah. I think you bring, you bring, you raise a really great point of of value that I think a lot of people overlook when they're getting started and are super focused on their tech and super focused on who are we selling this to and how can we get that done and raise some money uh, as opposed to dr- taking a look at more holistically. How are they building a great word is uh, like a really solid, thoughtful company, and maybe even I don't say brand exactly, but building more value into what they're creating by pulling in more, you know, P 
people who are tied to building value in the company, including healthcare consumers, right? So they're another buyer in a way. Let's say the facility is a hospital. You have people in the hospital who are buying. You have payers who are buying. You have healthcare consumers who are buying, right? They're all paying something and it matters. That piece matters as well. So, yeah. So, so just a quick aside on that. So back in my day with Smith and Nephew in 2009, uh, we received FDA approval for a bearing surface that would allow a knee uh, to last 30 years under normal conditions. And uh, up until that time, it was only mm -hmm. 10 years. And it's very hard to move market share in orthopedics. Uh, sales reps and doctors have very tight relationships. And it's a big learning curve to move from one mm -hmm. system to another. Um, uh, so people usually kind of are very sticky. And so we did a direct-to-consumer campaign. And, and we educated consumers that, hey, there's a need that can last longer. And for the duration of that campaign and the, and the awareness that we created, I mean, there were people who uh, you know, were being wheeled uh, into the operating room uh, to have a striker knee. Uh, and they were asking for the 30-year knee. And am I getting that 30-year knee? And next thing you know, the doctor's calling the Smith and Nephew rep and changing the, uh, uh, changing the case. So, um, you know, depending upon, we don't want to drive our business by D to C because you can't educate people effectively in 30 seconds or right. 60 seconds. Um, but there is a power to going directly to the consumer and you take, and it does help you at times break through some of uh, the barriers that, uh, that existed. And, and to the extent that, again, I would be in that experience today, I'd want to educate consumers up front what to expect when having a, a, our mm -hmm. knee. And I'd want them to have a portal that gave them important clinical study information on how well their knee's doing or give them updates and, and, and whatnot. Anything that, to create that engagement, I think, is, is will build brand and then potential word of mouth referral from the patients like, yeah, I got this knee. It's awesome. And then now they're telling me how everything's going and it feels great. And they, they can tell it to other people too. So just one little example. Yeah, I think I also, you know, it, it, it makes me remember that, and I haven't looked at it this last year, but in, in the past handful of years, there's a, like a reputational survey. I forget who runs it uh, internationally of like the largest companies and categories. And they have a specific methodology and they return it every year. Uh, and every year, I mean, med device isn't pharma, but they look at pharma. And pharma is like below grocery stores and like trust level. They look at trust level. And pharma is always at the bottom of the barrel. And I always figured med device is somewhere, right? It has to be kind of somewhere in the ballpark of that. And I think there's tremendous opportunity for uh, healthcare companies, right, which we're supposed to be, uh, to engage the people who are the recipients of the healthcare and, and to develop that kind of trust by sharing information and knowledge and uh, to allow them to make, I mean, you know, we know what informed consent is, allow them to make informed decisions. So I think there's a... You know, there's been a great jump start with Google and friends thereof uh, in opening up this information. And I think that continues to, to grow and med device companies can increase their value to be blunt by doing the right thing in that particular case. So I love that you're really thinking about wise. patients and how that might work in uh, specific use cases. So it's super helpful. All right. So uh, the last thing I, I really wanted to talk to you about that I find really interesting is this intersect, right? You and I are like longtime med device people. And then you had the, you know, you ran in touch health, a uh, successful exit to Teladoc. And as you think about ecosystem, and so I'll, I'll define this. I think about ecosystem as competitors and partners and traditional, you called it classic, I like that word, the classic medical device company would, con would consider competitors and partners might be a couple distributors, OUS, as far as a startup is concerned, right? Or vendors as kind of partners. I think software is really kind of like blown open, this idea of 
uh, partners, right? And I looked at, for example, I'm looking for some new marketing software. And one company I looked at had a native, had maybe seven native integrations with other software. And I was like, Who, what? <laughs> and then I was looking at another one and they had 870 native integrations with other software partners. And I look at the two and I say, well, I know which one's going to be winning and growing and doing more. So clearly, you know, this is my, cho- you know, assuming they do the same sorts of things, this is my, this is my choice, right? So can you talk a little bit about med device and health IT and software space about competition and partners and how some classic med device folks should be maybe thinking about this a bit differently, can learn from health IT? Sure. Well, w- one of the things I don't believe exists in medical device is coopetition. Um, that is very much uh, uh, an everyday term uh, in IT because uh, y- you know you can't. Uh, there's not one software that can do everything. Uh, there and every, and you know the constituents out there, uh, our customers um, hate the term platform. You know, everyone who's developing a software gets so in love with it and thinks that, hey, everyone can get on my platform. Um, and the truth is the hospitals are trying to build their own platform and uh, or constituents. And there are so many, healthcare is so complex. Um, and one of the mistakes companies made, and I've seen it because our my companies I've been in have made the same mistake, is you get so focused on the development of your solution. Um, that you don't put the time and energy to understand uh, either, first of all, how do you scale it commercially and do you have all the systems necessary to scale it commercially? But then more importantly, how does this product uh, play in the sandbox with mm-hmm. other products? Um, some of the best companies, ones I've been so impressed with are, are, are exactly as you defined, Maureen, where the architecture is simple. Uh, they're using you know, standards uh, and, and certain, you know, certain standards for communications. They create APIs that are very understood to be able to either import important data or export data to other systems. And as your product uh, is sit, if your product can easily sit into an ecosystem, it has so much more value than just what your original you know, uh, problem, uh, your original design intent was was focusing on. Because now, like, we're on this call, if there was a software application that, you know, made, had, you know, consumer sentiment analysis, say, or, or patient sentiment analysis that allowed a physician, a behavioral health specialist to see, hey, you know, maybe you're you're getting aggravated with me, or maybe you're getting bored, or maybe I'm talking too much. And it gave me that data. Well, it'd be cool software. And if you had all this great and incredible w- ways to show it, but if it didn't integrate to the software we're using right now, how would you use it? You know. And so, you know, the ones that are easy just to load and and get in and to sit into an existing ecosystem, the more credit you get for the value mm-hmm. of your product. So not just solving its problem, but the ability for it to be used and to be used seamlessly. And and. Uh, and I think hospitals and and payers and everyone looking at healthcare data, whether it's their revenue cycle management software, whether it's their patient data software, whether it's their scheduling or or others, you know, the ability of coming up with with a solution and and taking the time when you architect your solution to understand this is going to work with other mm-hmm. things, so you create commonality, and then thinking through how your APIs work and putting APIs out there so you have all of these intersections, uh, it would it would give you a tremendous advantage over others uh, who haven't thought that. And if you think about it upfront, it's low cost. But if you have to then build in architecture and think about this after, because along the design criteria, you didn't factor in the need to export and import certain types of behaviors, mm-hmm. um, it'll be very expensive to fix on the back end. Great, great advice. Great advice. Uh, that no one solution ha- is perfect for all all possible eventualities. It has to have the ability to kind of live within and in and through other solutions. And 
uh, I think what's particularly important is this idea that if you've done that with your your solution, uh, that then what you said was you get credit for having done that, right? The ability to then interconnect with other things yeah. in their system, which they've decided for whatever reason are the things they they want. Um, to run whatever it is they're running. So. And it can make life, and it can also, Maureen, it can make life more simple. So say there was a telemedicine application that used video and uh, there was a certain algorithm or certain way to present data that would be interesting to the users, uh, but you ultimately needed a video comms. Well, you can go create your own video comms, your own codec and build the whole thing. You know, or you just create an API to Zoom or an API to Teams. And so the user experience is, hey, I have this whole telemedicine thing and I have this great capability and the experience is great. And so you get credit for that whole experience, even though you're using someone else's platform mm -hmm. uh, to do it. Um, so you know, it, it's, it's about being smart. It's about focusing where you create value. Don't try to boil the ocean. Uh, and then interface with others and make it easier for the end user to, to install and, and then to use your product. I think it that it's all great. It's all great kind of advice and information. I think that what it what it entails then is understanding not so much I'm going to build the platform and they're all going to come to me as much as maybe what is. Would you say kind of what is your core competency? Like what are your boundaries? What's your core competency and how do you fit in and interoperate amongst the other ones? How do you figure out where those boundaries are? Well, you, you stay true to what innovation you're trying to create. And, mm -hmm. and if, you're, if you're solving a major problem that no one's solved before, keep solving that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to now the delivery of your solution, if you if it requires other capabilities that are commoditized, don't put R and D in it. Just API to the other product, mm -hmm. and P, and and don't don't try to boil the ocean and put very valuable R uh, research uh, into things that have already been discovered. Um, you know, you can create a lot of leverage by staying uh, to the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, in, and then creating great integrations to all different types of platforms. So the user experience is great. And the value you create for investors stays extremely high because your R&D is focused on solving problems that other people aren't focused on versus having to recreate uh, things that exist uh, because you want to build a platform. Uh, I think you'll create a much more value in the short term. And then over time, if you feel it's necessary to insource and to build those things out, you do it you know, with strength and you do it with cash flow. Um, you know, you don't do it by potentially impacting. Remember, we talked about time, mm -hmm. right? If you're burning money and you have a certain amount of time, focus that energy on what's most unique to uh, the, the solution and don't put energy into things that have already been solved for. Great. That is a great way to kind of distill this down, distill down what the focus needs to be and what you can leave to be bought, purchased, partnered kind of externally with other people who have done kind of best in class work uh, in that regard so that you're solving for your unique kind of innovation. So that makes, that makes a lot of sense. That's it. Uh, so uh, last couple of questions. Uh, is is there anything on messaging that I haven't asked you today that you think people ought to know that you've learned about what you kind of should or shouldn't do in that regard, whether it's investors or patients, providers? We talk about patients a lot. We talk about investors a lot. Um, anything I didn't ask you that you were hoping I'd ask? No, you've done you've done a pretty good job. I mean, there's 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 a lot of ways to to get into messaging. The the ones that that I like the most are the ones that are authentic. You know, the ones that really kind of resonate and meet a need and and have you know the ability and the mission uh, to create value for multiple constituents. But it's the authenticity. Like if you overreach, 
in your investor decks how your metrics are going to beat all these incumbents that have created billions of dollars of value and you're going to cure this and solve for that you know it's important to be aspirational but it's important to also be credible and authentic and mm -hmm. and that authenticity especially in today's uh, environment is is so important um and hopefully that messaging is standing on top of a very solid corporate mission with a very mm -hmm. solid value statement that everyone believes in. Um, you know, again, I, I think authenticity today uh, is is going to receive a premium value. And if, mm -hmm. if you get ahead of yourself or you're blusterous or you make false claims or, you know, there's a balance between aspiration and, uh, you know, being in touch with reality. Uh, and, you know, investors want to see a roadmap as to how you're going to succeed. And then they have to bet to believe that you're going to do that. And so authenticity and uh, is 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 the one thing I'd add to, to the conversation. Yeah, critical, critical piece. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, authenticity in, in this day and age, yeah, is goes miles. Uh, and we know that we also know the downside of that, right? In a nanosecond <laughs> okay. with... The way the news travels. So I think being on that That's is right. a tremendous words of wisdom about being authentic and, and sticking to the mission and making sure that everyone's kind of aligned around that. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so last few questions, last three questions. So uh, kind of a, a little bit more fun uh, to kind of close this out. So if you could go you could snap your fingers and go anywhere in the world today. Where would it be and who would you take? Um, uh, right here, right now. Um, uh, I told my wife after we um, exited in touch that, um, you know, we could live wherever we wanted. And um, I, I know a lot of people, we were living in Santa Barbara, which is uh, absolutely paradise and one of my favorite places um but uh i want to be wherever my wife is happy and she is very happy uh in memphis tennessee and my my kids are very happy here uh and so you know i i'm in a place now where uh, i'm where i want to be and i'm with the people i, I want i want to have now obviously i think this this question is like who would you take would you you know you could take Gandhi and Jesus and all the, you know, and have this great conversation and great walk. Uh, you know, I have to tell you, I've, I've been retired for a month um, and uh, being with your children and, and, and having a perspective of being mm -hmm. with your family and, and turning off all of the, I got to do this and got to do that and just ground yourself. Um, you know, I, I would take, I have five kids. Uh, so I, I, if I was going anywhere, I'd, I'd have my five kids with me every day and I would just be anywhere that makes my wife happy because when she's happy, I'm happy. So a pretty simple answer, but it's kind of reflective of where I'm at today. That's a that's a tremendous answer. I love that answer. No one's answered Kanye and Jesus yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I love that answer. And I think right with the with the pandemic and that a lot of people have kind of found that again, those pieces that are what's meaningful and more important. So I think that that's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear. Uh, and I'm sure your wife and your Thank kids you. are lucky to have you there as well. Uh, so if you could give one piece of advice to folks in their kind of 20s and 30s, kind of, you know, climbing up, looking at med device and health IT and all these things, uh, as you reflect back, and what advice would you give them? I would have them um, get into this market and uh, enjoy this market. You know, there's being in a business that has uh, purpose is very important. You know, do everything you can to not make work work, but make work, your, your, you know, you can eliminate the word work if you're working on something that, that you're passionate about. Um, and if you're passionate about helping people uh, and you you get those rewards, you know, the economic rewards exist in healthcare. Mm -hmm. 
Um, either you can make the money you need to make. Uh, you can aspire to the highest levels. And uh, I have a lot of colleagues that I look up to who have done such an um, unbelievable job. So you can economically uh, meet your goals. Um, but to do it with a sense of purpose um, and putting that purpose first will fulfill you more than, than chasing. You know, the grass is always greener. And there's always something else out there. But, you know, to stay in healthcare, uh, to be true to a mission, to help people, um, uh, for me, has been something I would never trade. Um, I've had opportunities to go outside this career. And I actually worried a little bit about going into healthcare IT, but that same mission exists mm -hmm. uh, it, for helping people. And so I, I would encourage those to um, enjoy healthcare, uh, be in it for the right reason. Um, and, you know, find ways that, you know, to not look at a job as a job and a grind and, you know, something you just have to get through, um, but to find uh, a mission that inspires mm -hmm. you, find something that, that moves you. The economics will always follow, mm -hmm. but if, you, if you're moved and you're touched and, and you put everything you have in your pure and your authentic um, this market will reward you and reward you as long as you're smart economically. You have to make sure that you're making good decisions. But, but if, you, if you pull all of that together, there's nothing more exciting than knowing that thousands and thousands, if not millions of people are being positively impacted by uh, decisions that you and your team and colleagues have made. Uh, and then as you do that, your business will grow, your economics will grow, your career will grow, and your heart will grow. Don't ever leave that behind. And find that balance always with your family. Um, make them a part of your journey, uh, have them enjoy uh, what you're doing and see that you're happy in what you're doing it and not just looking at something as a way to, a way to sustain yourself um, uh, financially. You want to sustain yourself holistically. And uh, healthcare is a great place to do that. And I hope you all realize that and, and uh, are able to reach that type of joy that I think both Maureen and I have had uh, in being uh, in this market. That is amazing advice. That is amazing advice. So thank you for that. I think it's easy at the beginning of your career, right, to kind of put your head down. I know I did it for a period of time, kind of try to ignore everything else, but that'll catch, that, that caught up with me. So I've, I learned from that. So it's great advice to give to people from the beginning uh, to make sure to kind of keep that in mind, uh, a more holistic view and mission and purpose and the rest will follow. I hear you on that. All right. Yep. Last question. What is, uh, what is one thing you wish more people knew about you? Oh, um, one thing I wish they knew about me. Um, well, um, I spend a lot of, uh, my time, uh, for charitable causes. I don't think people realize that I'm on the board of uh, St. Jude mm -hmm. Children's Research Hospital um, here in Memphis, and that's a, a real life passion. Uh, I'm fortunate to have five healthy kids and have not had to deal with that. And so for, for me to give back and to, and to help, um, it's kind of consistent with being in healthcare, but it's, it's something that I get to work with a lot of incredible people from different backgrounds. Uh, on a founder's mission of no child uh, should uh, die in the dawn of their life or no child should be told they have cancer. Um, and, you know, we're working really hard uh, to find cures and to uh, improve the, the, their lives. And it's something that, uh, that now that I've had more time, I'm, I'm dedicating more uh, time and energy to. So um, I guess my work at St. Jude is probably the one thing that uh, most people don't realize that I do. Yeah, tremendous, tremendous. That is great that you're giving your time and energy to such a very worthy cause and such a yeah devastating. Yeah, I, I have no talent, Maureen. I, I don't <laughs> sing. I don't play guitar. I don't have this, you know, this unique thing in the in in the that can just say, "Hey, did you know I play banjo?" <laughs> I, I don't. I, I haven't dedicated any any time to that. I'm not that interesting a person. I've just tried to, you know, to succeed and provide and do the right thing. And 
and I've been blessed that I've been blessed uh, in, in making that my focus. So. That's great. That's great. You're yeah, you're, you're doing a lot, Joe. So I don't think you need to play banjo. <laughs> Maybe one of your five kids can take up banjo for you. <laughs> Start a band, family band yeah. in, your, in your retirement. Right? Yes. That would be so cool. You are in Memphis, after all. It's close to Nashville. That's right. That's right. First, uh, first jazz, first blues song. There you go. Yep. All right. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. I have... Thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking with you and reconnecting. And thank you for dropping all the gems that I know everyone is going to benefit from. And uh, very, very much appreciate it. So uh, that's it for Message Engineer. Thanks so much for being with us today with Joe DeVivo, and who is in retirement slash on a career break. Interested to see where that pans out. And where that goes. And uh, we'll see you next time on Message Engineer. 